Hey everyone, I'm Chris, and in this video I'm going to do a deep dive into a core feature of Neo FPS, Motion Graphs and the Motion Graph Editor. So, what is it? Well, a Motion Graph is a state machine, similar to Unity's animator state machines, and it's used to enable developers to design and iterate complex movement mechanics through an easy to use visual interface. Now what that means is that you have a graph editor that lets you connect movement states together and control when and how a character transitions between them as they move through a scene. So, first up, how to access the Motion Graph Editor. The first way is through the toolbar by going to Tools, Neo FPS, Motion Graph Editor. You can then select a Motion Graph to edit using the field at the top left. You can also create a new graph from within the editor by right clicking in the project view and selecting Create, Neo FPS, Motion Graph. With the Motion Graph asset selected, You'll notice that the inspector view for the asset is just a show motion graph editor button, so you can also open the editor that way. Selecting a motion graph asset in the project, or selecting a game object with a motion controller component that references a motion graph, such as the demo solo character prefab, will switch the graph that is currently being edited. You can also select a character when in play mode to see the graph updating as the character moves around and switches states. Right, let's run through the editor and how to use it. On the right here is the viewport, which you use to build the graph, and on the left is the motion graph parameters and motion data. I'll come back to these later, but for now let's concentrate on the viewport. So the viewport can be moved around by holding the middle mouse button and dragging, or if you're using a trackpad or similar you can move around by holding the left alt key and left click dragging. Left clicking on a graph node will select it, making it visible in the inspector. You can also select multiple items using the left control key, or by left click dragging, starting on an empty area of the viewport. Left click dragging on a node will move that node, or multiple if the node you start dragging on is part of a group selection. You can also left click the arrows on connections between nodes to inspect the connection, though these cannot be group selected or moved. Right clicking in the viewport shows a context menu depending on what was under the cursor when you clicked, and what you currently have selected. Looking at the contents of the graph, the rectangular nodes are motion states. A state controls the actual movement of the character, such as a falling state or a jump state. You can create a state by right clicking on an empty area of the viewport and selecting add state, and then the specific state that you want to add. More states will be coming in future updates, along with all kinds of other goodies to expand the motion graph. The nodes with the rounded ends are subgraphs. Subgraphs are a means of grouping and organizing states. You can enter a subgraph by double clicking on it, or by right clicking and selecting Show Subgraph. At the top of the viewport, you can see a breadcrumb trail that shows you where you currently are in the graph. The green subgraph in the viewport is the subgraph that you're currently viewing. Double clicking on this will take you back up to its parent subgraph. You can also right click in it or on an empty area of the viewport and select Show Parent Graph. You can add a subgraph by right clicking in an empty area of the viewport and selecting Add Subgraph. The lines that you see between nodes are graph connections. You can connect two nodes by right clicking on the start node and selecting make transition, and then left clicking on the end node. These connections have a number of conditions, which if met will cause the graph to transition from the start node to the end node. However, it isn't just the current state's connections that are evaluated. Each of the parent subgraphs outward connections are checked first, starting from the root of the graph and then working down to the current state. For example, Let's say we're currently in the crouch state, and we want to check for a transition before moving. Crouch is in the controlled subgraph, which in turn is in grounded, which is in movement. So first of all, the connections out of the movement subgraph are checked. Have we contacted one of the ladder types? No. So we move on. We don't check the connections from the movement subgraph to its children, as the point here is that we're checking if we should exit the current subgraph. So we know movement is fine. We now check each of the connections out of the grounded subgraph. Have we jumped, dodged, or lost contact with the ground? Let's say no, so we move on. Is the ground surface above the slope angle that means that we start sliding? Again, let's say no. Now we're back to the current state. So we check the outward connection from this. Is the crouch input switch false? And do we have the headroom to stand up? If not, then we stay in the crouch state. If so, then we transition to null, and the connections out of that state are evaluated until we find the state that we should be in. So the connections are evaluated in this kind of root to current node order to allow certain conditions and movements to take precedence over each other. 
The ladders are a good example of this, as it doesn't really matter if a character is running, walking or falling. If they attach to a ladder, then they should switch to the relevant ladder state regardless. Another thing you might have noticed is the orange nodes. These are default nodes. When you're entering a subgraph, the connections from the subgraph to its children are evaluated in order. If none of their conditions are met, then control is passed to the default node. The first node that you place inside a subgraph will automatically be set to the default node, and you can also right click on any other node and select set default if you want to change it. So that's everything in the viewport and an overview of how the graphs function at a high level. It can be a bit tricky to get your head around at first, but it's super powerful once you do. Okay, now let's look at the motion graph elements in the inspector. Selecting a graph node in the viewport will show it in the inspector here and allow you to modify its properties. States and subgraphs both have a number of properties in common. You can change their name here, and you can change the order that their connections are evaluated by dragging the connections up and down in the out connections list here. If you select a connection, then you can see its conditions in the list here. You can add a new one by clicking the plus at the bottom of the list and selecting the relevant condition. Character conditions are based on the character controller or other components in the character hierarchy. Graph conditions are dependent on the graph itself, such as the amount of time spent in the current state. Physics conditions involve things like raycasting from the character's location. And lastly, parameter conditions are based on the parameters applied to the graph. You can change the order the conditions are evaluated in by dragging the handles on the left around and removing them by selecting and hitting the minus button here. Lastly, you can change whether the connection should only transition if all conditions are met or if any one of the conditions is met. We'll take a look at inspecting states now. And this highlights two of the other features of the graph, parameters and motion data. If I select the repulse state here, you can see its properties in the inspector. This is just like inspecting any mono behavior or scriptable object, but you'll see that in all the states included with NeoFPS, the properties have been split into parameters, motion data, and then the state's other properties. Parameters are just like the parameters you would see on Unity's animator controllers. They're a way for scripts outside the graph to interact with it and vice versa. If you want the character to jump, then you set the jump trigger parameter, and then the graph will check that trigger at the relevant point. If you want to tell the character how high, then you set the jump charge parameter with a float value, and the jump state will read that value when it's calculating the character motion. There are a few additions to the motion graph parameters that set them apart from animator parameters though. The motion graph also allows you to set transform parameters, which are useful for things like attaching a character to a ladder, and an event parameter, which allows the graph to fire events that the outside scripts can subscribe to and react. Looking at the repulse state again, this repulse transform property is a dropdown that lets you select one of the transform parameters on the current graph. You can also create a new one by selecting create new. If I create a new parameter called my transform, then you can see that it is now selected in the dropdown and a new parameter has appeared in the motion graph editor. These same parameters are also referenced in motion graph behaviors and in the conditions for graph connections too. For example, that ladder transform parameter is used as a condition for the connection into the ladder state. If the transform parameter is not null, then the condition and therefore the connection is valid. Similarly, this connection out of the ladder state checks if the parameter is null again. Motion data has some similarities to parameters. If we look at the motion data tab in the graph editor here, you can see that they look the same. But the available types are limited to float, int, and ball. Motion data is intended to represent movement characteristics such as speed, which shouldn't be modified from outside the graph that frequently. In fact, the only way to modify motion data outside the editor is to use an override such as the override asset accessible via this create override asset button here. This creates a new asset file alongside the motion graph, which allows you to override any of the graph data. You can then add this to a character's motion controller along with the graph to give that character its own unique characteristics. You can also create your own override scripts if you desire. For example, you might want the motion data to be affected by character stats or buffs or debuffs. You could create an override script that calculates multipliers based on those stats and applies those to the graph's default values instead. Back to the repulse state, and you can see that this repulse multiplier is set to the ladder jump off motion data. This value, set to 1 in the editor, is a multiplier that's applied to the repulse vector, which moves the character relative to the transform in the repulse transform parameter. Clicking the drop down 
shows the valid float data entries on the motion graph and allows you to create a new motion data entry. Another way that motion data varies from parameters is that you can set the motion data dropdown to none and a value field will appear below it. This allows you to simply use a set value in certain instances, though this does mean that you lose the ability to share the values between different states uh, for easier editing and to override them later. Together, the parameters, motion data and properties allow you to edit states. If you want, you can also click the script field to be taken to that state script and see how it works. You can also add your own states very easily. Um, more information on that is available in the documentation. And the last thing to look at is motion graph behaviors. These are attached to states or subgraphs and are updated each fixed function movement frame. For example, the crouch state here has a number of behaviors attached. This one sets the height of the character on entering and exiting the state. These ones block or modify a number of the parameters on the graph to control the flow. This one handles footstep audio, specifying a step interval, a footstep library, and even casting down to the ground to check the surface type for each step. This last one lowers the ground friction on slopes if no input is detected, and then raises it back up again when the character starts moving. You can add a new behavior by clicking the Add Behavior dropdown and selecting the desired behavior from the list. So, that should have been a pretty thorough guide to working with motion graphs, and give you some idea of how powerful they can be. Remember that at any point you can click on the help icons to be taken to the relevant page in the documentation. Thanks for watching! If you have any questions then please get in touch via the Discord server. You can also visit the website at neofps.com for more information. All the links are in the description below. Have fun, and let me know how it goes!